The following program is for informational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is a new science, so do your homework before putting money on the line. Today is March 5th, 2014. This is episode 89. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today, yes, it's still about Gox, but less about the problem and more about solutions. Decentralized exchanges have been a hot topic in this space for years, and Mt. Gox was always the primary reason why people understood they were so vital to develop. Turns out, that's exactly what John Torell has done in their upcoming meta-exchange altcoin, MetaLayer. Earlier this year, he and Stephanie caught up about the project, and although some time has passed since the interview, it's incredibly timely. We end today's show with this. But first, what is GoxCoin? Why would anyone want to use it? How would it work? Tim Swanson, author of the recently published Great Chain of Numbers Guide to Smart Properties, sits in as moderator for our panel discussion featuring David Johnston, Pete Earle, and myself on the GoxCoin project. Enjoy the show. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Swanson, and we're here with a special episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. We're here with Adam B. Levine, who's obviously the editor-in-chief, and we're also with David Johnson, who's the managing director of BitAngels, as well as a board member of the MasterCoin Foundation. And the last member of this panel is Pete Earle, who is probably most famous for his economics articles written in the last couple of years. Today's topic is about GoxCoin, which is a new project that I think David could probably explain best. David, can you explain how this fuses in with the MasterCoin protocol? We're looking for ways to leverage the new technologies that Bitcoin gives us to help the people that are sort of stranded as part of the whole Gox process. The core concept is to issue a coin that can track people's claims around the coins that they've lost from Gox. Meaning that if you had a account which you had 10 Bitcoins in, right now sort of those records are all held by Gox. And the idea is for the community to encourage Gox to release those records so that they can be converted into these coins in order to be able to trade around that as an asset. I mean, we all know that the process, there's a lot of legal cases around this, and the process is probably going to take a very long time to work itself out. There are a lot of question marks around how the Japanese legal system is going to treat Bitcoins. And so this seems like an interesting way to help the people that had funds at Gox in order to track their ownership. If they're not optimistic about Gox recovering any of the uh, funds, then maybe they sell this ownership. And whoever holds the claim when the whole Gox situation resolves gets the Bitcoin proportional to the amount that they held. Where the master protocol comes in is we're not interested in creating another blockchain We're not interested in creating something that people have to mine. And so we can use the master protocol in order to issue these coins and using Bitcoin as the ledger that keeps those records. And so we sort of avoid all the complexity of having to have miners or a separate blockchain. And we're simply using this as a way to record these assets and then move them around. Looking at the amount of Bitcoins that have disappeared from Mt. Gox, which is around 750,000 plus maybe 100,000 of their own, how many of these do you think you can legitimately track? How does that process take place? How do you know who's lost stuff? How, how do you keep track of that kind of database? There's a couple of ways this can go. Either Gox can release the records to a third party or they could issue these coins according to their records. And either way it goes, Basically, you have to have had a verified account with Gox. It's going to be based on the data that they have from the last moment in which they were in operation. And so there are already groups collecting claimants that have thousands of people that are making claims. And so this sort of offers those people a way to track it. We would think of this as an opt-in type of system. We're not going to force anybody to participate, but if you wanted to track your ownership in this way or trade uh, your ownership in this way, then you could opt into this type of system and prove that you had this balance and you would be issued those coins in proportion to the amount of your balance. So we're thinking one-to-one ratio. So if you had 10 Bitcoins, then you'd be issued 10 Gox coins or recovery coins or whatever makes sense for this project. 
That's really interesting, and, and I understand that uh, human is uh, tied in with this, and Adam, you are kind of spearheading that uh, group, I think, as an advisor, right? Yeah, I'm actually the chief visionary officer with the human group, and uh, you know, in our normal day job, when we, <laughs> when we actually deliver on a product, because we're talking to a lot of customers, but we haven't actually come out with anything yet, we deal with brands and try to help them understand the potential of cryptocurrency as it basically exists for them now, because there are a lot of opportunities for, uh, you know, David brought up a really interesting point with regards to uh, to MasterCoin and the problems that it doesn't need to solve. We don't need a blockchain for something like this Gox coin. We don't need mining for something like this blockchain. It literally, I mean, it's not a, it's not proof of stake, so you don't want to go down that road. And so these meta coins, MasterCoin was a later addition to the project. And we realized that we needed a platform like MasterCoin because we didn't want to spin off a new blockchain and we didn't want to manage all of these things. Or really, we don't want to do anything. We'd, we'd prefer that this be the plaintiffs handling it for themselves Essentially, what we're doing is developing a proof of goxed protocol that will let any plaintiff group or private recovery effort come to human with claims certified by the Japanese courts. That'll then mandate human to create the verified amount and distribute it back to the group who just submitted the claims. That means you can have one big recovery effort or a bunch of little ones, but they all use the same token. So anytime any coins are recovered, they're split between all holders of Gox coin. With regards to Human, yeah, Human has been looking at these problems because there are a lot of different projects that we're working on that all surround these user-created assets because they let you essentially take all of the advantages of cryptocurrency and apply them to any sort of problem without having to worry about all of the other stuff. So what kind of time frame are you guys looking at with, number one, releasing Goxcoin, and number two, actual getting the plaintiffs involved with this? Do you think this is a multi-year process, or is this something that's just going to be a short six-week kind of project? The project itself, I can see something like this continuing for 100 years, because if you think about it, how we don't really know how many, how many Bitcoins are even missing. We don't know if they're lost. We don't know if they're stolen. So those those are things that could take years to work out. And the reality is, is that even if it's discovered that all of these were stolen and somebody else has them, this is a huge amount of value that's essentially going to be sitting there on the blockchain and people will be watching it. You know, all of this stuff that happened on the blockchain is going to be untangled just because there's such a huge financial motivation to do so. So from a project perspective, you know, I can see this rolling out in something like three weeks once we have the information that's necessary. And this is another interesting point is that there are people who are concerned that a solution like this could never work because Mt. Gox won't or can't work with us. And this is something we've talked about a lot, too. But, you know, as was mentioned, you could do this through a private recovery effort. You know, you could have people who have claims in Mt. Gox band together and say, we're going to seek recovery on these Bitcoins that we verify that we have. And then they can create these tokens. So you could have you know, multiple different essentially class action lawsuits or recovery efforts. So the process really works whether or not Mt. Gox is on board. And it can happen very fast, but it's important that the coins be given to the right people. That really, that's like the most important part. And it is a tough problem right now. Yeah, speaking of that, maybe you guys could answer this. How does the KYC work with that? I know that's probably at the bottom of the list of things to do, but let's say these people, <laughs> you know, you, you want to help out everybody. But what if you have people who could be held liable for various illicit activities? How do you handle handing out different Gox coins to, to people that you don't have a KYC on? Everybody who is trading at Gox really should have at least basic KYC. So again, like this, this goes beyond my area of expertise. We'd have to pull in somebody who's on legal to talk about this too intelligently. But I can tell you that anybody who has a verified account at Mt. Gox should have gone through KYC or they wouldn't have a verified account. So that's really the type of people that we're talking about right now because it is easier to do that. I see. Okay, so kind of like tranches. You want to start with somebody who could definitely verify who their identity is that they actually had it. So this is in a way what we had with six years ago where you had these defaults on CDOs, these different instruments. You had different tranches of debt repayment. So you would say the first level of bond holders would be these very verified customers. Is that, is that what you're saying, Adam? Yeah, but the difference is, is that in a recovery like that, you're talking about people being paid back at different rates, whereas here we're just talking about people chronologically. So people who are uh, harder to verify or take longer to verify will simply take longer before they get back the token. But the token itself is a claim on one Bitcoin, whether you got it at the very beginning of the process or at the end of the process. Now, of course, this is a recovery. So there's almost certainly never going to be one full Bitcoin given back to each of these Goxcoin holders. It'll be some fraction of that. But the point is, is that because it's in a deflationary currency instead of an inflationary currency, that's actually OK. You might wind up with more money than at the end than you had at the beginning <clears throat> just because of that. I see. I see. Yeah, it's really interesting. And speaking of inflationary and deflationary, I 
Peter, I got to bring you in here. The article I know you best for is uh, your your discussion on on mudflation and economics and how faucets and, and, and sinks work in a digital world. Uh, what is your thoughts on this whole process with with Gox coins and the entire uh, Gox fiasco? One of the things that struck me immediately was that this would probably be impossible to do in the world of uh, you know hard money uh, securities and derivatives. The flexibility of the cryptocurrencies allows you not only to put in place the sorts of sharing features that the cryptocurrencies do, but also it has to do with the, um, you know, essentially the, the network effects and that the rules around and the system that value these types of assets, these cryptocurrencies, essentially make them more viable in and of themselves. And uh, it would be very difficult to accomplish this kind of recovery with a so-called fiat uh, currency denominated with a paper instrument. It's a very hybrid type of thing we've got going on here that has some features of the recovery rate that you might find in a credit default swap. It's similar in some ways to a uh, convertible bond, that sort of thing, which, which I think it makes it extremely compelling. What we may be creating here is sort of the wave of the future or sort of you know an example of how these types of things when they occur in the future if they occur in the future will be handled kind of like a secondary clearinghouse a secondary market is, is that what you're thinking about doing yeah that's essentially what it comprises one of the things i've been saying for for a while now as i've been um a couple of years now i've been following the, the growth of cryptocurrencies in particular not only uh bitcoin is that it's great that the bitcoin economy has all these things happening in terms of places to consume bitcoin and things to do with it but one of the things to really make the economy of what I call the unstate of Bitcoinistan, really vibrant and sort of, you know, anti-fragile would be, we need things like auditors, you know, specialized auditors. We need reviewers. We definitely need, you know, raters and, you know, people who fill a role like something like S&P would in the uh, debt issuance world out here uh, outside of the virtual uh, currency world. But also, you know, what we need are strong venues, voluntary venues to arbitrate and mediate controversies. States, with their um, fiat currencies and their brick and mortar courts are not really going to be terribly sympathetic. Uh, I think in most cases to um, controversies which arise of the cryptocurrency world. So those are things that we have to be thinking about as this process goes forward. Interesting. So you're talking about maybe independent arbitrators and outside auditing and insurance. I know that's been kind of like the top Absolutely. I, I remember reading an article recently about some company in Boston that's apparently insuring their Bitcoins. Does that kind of tie in to… Absolutely. Um, that would make a, um, a very sound accoutrement to what we're working on here. So you you know not only do you have a way of um, helping make these economically injured holders whole, but also they have the right of recourse and they have some way of you know like I said mediating or arbitrating as the case may be the controversy. I see. Now, I'm David, I know you've been working uh, kind of as a side project with I think it was general governance was one of your other projects. And how can something like that tie into this process of giving like a framework for Gox coins being both legitimate? and to be considered, I guess you could say, a tradable asset on other exchanges. Do you, do you see that not only could you have a legal framework built with it, but then you could maybe convince other exchanges to allow these to be exchanged on them as well? Sure. When we first started this process, there was a couple of exchanges that expressed interest in trading these Gox coins so that users have an ability to trade them for Bitcoin. And I think it's important to emphasize, like Adam mentioned earlier, we don't want to give people the false expectation that one Gox coin is going to equal one Bitcoin. It's clear that Mt. Gox has uh, lost or had stolen a lot of Bitcoin. And so these would be coins that trade at some substantial discount to the regular price of Bitcoin. And it would really depend on how that recovery process is coming, either for the lost keys or the stolen funds. And so people would over time speculate and the price would fluctuate based on how well those recovery processes are going or how poorly those processes are going. But I just want to set expectations that this would be something that would likely trade at a, a very steep discount to regular Bitcoins. I do think it's important, like Peter and Adam have mentioned, that this is a bad situation and this is sort of the least bad option, right? This isn't a perfect solution and there yeah, are rough edges. Something's better than nothing, that, right? Right. There are rough edges around how you issue them correctly and getting docs to cooperate by providing the data or issuing them unilaterally, as Adam mentioned, by a group that's basically doing a class auction lawsuit. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's probably the best solution that we've been able to come up with or, or think of. And waiting for the courts for years to hash it out 
And as Adam emphasized, they're going to do it at some price that's probably a lot lower than the real value of Bitcoin over time. The solution avoids a lot of those issues. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity to leverage the technology the community has here in order to do what we can to make the best of a bad situation. There's even been talk of the logo for this project should be lemonade, right? Because we're making <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, you know, it's it's not funny because, you know, a lot of people have lost a lot of funds and it's, it's a very serious matter, but add a little levity to the fact that we're we're trying to make the best of the situation that we can. So yeah, I mean certainly the project is still in an early phase. And we're looking for the community to give us input and for the community to continue encouraging Gox to go down this route versus some other route that would lock up everybody's funds for a very long time and sort of presenting this as a solution. So that, that's the frame that I'm thinking about it in. CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. Would you like to buy Bitcoin? Cash into Coins provides the fastest, easiest, and safest way to buy Bitcoin in the United States. Simply place an order online, deposit cash at any supported bank, and relax. Cash into Coins will verify your deposit and send out your Bitcoin within 24 hours. Join tens of thousands of people who have purchased from Cash Into Coins. What are you waiting for? Buy your Bitcoin today. Go to cashintocoins.com. That's cashintocoins.com. Adam, I know the last week or so you've been having several uh, interviews with various insiders and people who have contact with Mount Gox. Have you been able to uh, talk to these individuals or Gox itself to find out how open they are to you know, using something like Gox coins or using an outside system like this to provide liquidity and maybe even some kind of funds for these people, some kind of recompensation? I have no proprietary information from Mount Gox. My impression... Uh, is that they are in full-on bunker mode and that they're just, again, with the... I think that there's a criminal investigation going on. I think that, uh, you know, they've got the bankruptcy proceedings going on. All of those things basically say that it almost doesn't really matter what Gox wants to do or, Mar or Mark Carpellis wants to do. They're going to shut up and they're not going to say really much of anything because they can't. So to David's point, I wanted to uh, quickly kind of mention one of the earlier concepts that was kicked around for this idea and why we didn't go with it. One of the the ideas has been to take Mt. Gox and everybody who has coins in it and turn those into equity and then a new exchange that would be run by the community and would be essentially would be run as a for-profit exchange that would pay fees back to the shareholders. And in this way, if the new Gox succeeded, then it would, you know, pay back shareholders over time and they would potentially profit because they would still own the shares even after they were paid back with the dividend. The problem with this is that it requires Mt. Gox to actually be a functional exchange. And I don't really think that that's ever going to be a good solution. It doesn't really matter if they rebrand. doesn't really matter if they completely change their team. I think that in any scenario where they relaunched as a community-run exchange, they would have a completely new team and all that stuff would be true. But it's just not that good a solution. It's better instead to focus on the things that we can control, which is that they have this huge problem that we don't understand the depth of. And very, very few people, even people who should know, apparently don't understand the depth of. And it's going to be confusing for a long time. So rather than going down this hole where we say, OK, well, we'll just say all these people who lost funds, they're shareholders. And then we'll bring in new money and then they'll capitalize the business and then they'll be shareholders along with everybody else. That is so many moving parts and requires people to make bad economic decisions in order to invest in it in the first place. You do that because you feel bad. You do this 
because this is real. This, this reflects real value, and the value is whatever is going to wind up being recovered. Like I said before, that value is out there in the wild, and it's in the wrong hands. It's in the hands of people to whom it does not belong. Those situations will rectify themselves in Bitcoin. We just haven't really seen a good enough reason to develop the tools yet, but I bet you this is it. That's a very powerful statement there. Um, so out of curiosity, what kind of – for the listeners out there, what kind of talent or skill or human capital or is this team – of yours looking for right now? Are you guys looking for lawyers, accountants, people who specialize in digging through big data? What can people talk about or how can they bring sources, resources to you? That's a really good question. Um, I think at this point, we're not looking for that much help. We're just trying to finish getting the plan in order and then seeing if Gox is willing to work with us. And if not, then we'll proceed in ways that don't require them to work with us. Yeah, I'd say that's a good way to summarize it. Really, the ball is sort of in their court. The goal for this week is to raise awareness about this proposal so that the community can encourage Gox to go down this road. If they don't, then this is going to go forward one way or another, probably as something issued unilaterally by one of the groups running the class action. And so that's the road forward. Either Gox is going to do the right thing and provide the information about everybody's accounts, or they're not, and then the community sort of has to do this uh, unilaterally. It would move faster, it would be cleaner, if Gox participates, and I, I really do encourage them to seriously consider this, and if they don't, it's it's going to take longer, and the account information is going to have to come out as part of court proceedings and lawsuits and things like that. So, But either way, I think Peter made a good point. This is a new technology that we can use for this purpose, and it's a lot better than the existing options. And so one way or another, this technology is going to get used for this type of application into the future. And this is sort of just the most pressing need that our community has at the moment. And so it seems like a really good use case for something like this. The technology, like you said, just this kind of secondary protocol didn't exist to allow it in the first place. You guys have been around for, what, six months. So, Peter, I had a question for you uh, with respect to the history of this kind of thing. How, how does this kind of recovery happen in the traditional brick and mortar world where you do have these different investigations and you have these different lawyers and litigators and you have this whole process of, of interaction? How does that usually take place in, in, in the real world? Typically what happens is um, where you have this kind of thing happen is when an issuer, a company, has debt outstanding and it either defaults on that debt. This is one of the areas where attorneys tend to get involved. Is, uh, any company that has debt outstanding is going to have some definitions as to what constitutes a default. Um, it could be a late payment. It could be no payment. In some cases, it could be something somewhat more exotic. Generally speaking, what constitutes a default would be not making a, uh, a dividend payment, that sort of thing. Or, you know, sometimes they can go up for review if their credit rating drops. But you know, it's interesting because one of the things that, that David said that I, I was chomping at the bit to um, jump in on is, and this is the same, by the way, as with debt defaults, no, almost nobody is going to be made completely whole. And likely the amounts are going to be probably somewhat on the low side. And uh, an example I have is from um, – when I was trading during the uh, financial crisis, 2007, 2008, 2009, suddenly there were a record number of firms, which were, um, you know, it travels in cycles. As we have bad economies, suddenly there's a, a rush of uh, firms which uh, default on their debt, and then all of a sudden all these things are brought into play, and there's hearings, and then the companies, either they come up with a restructuring plan or sometimes they're liquidated or that type of thing. But anyway, I remember that the estimate that was used, sort of the default estimate, and by the way, this was considered pessimistic, and most of the credit default swaps which sort of serve as the barometer of the likelihood of default on uh, publicly traded debt was about 40 cents to the dollar. One of the first deals, I don't remember the exact firm, but I do remember the number. Once the proceedings were done, it turned out that the actual recovery was not 40 cents on the dollar, but 8 cents on the dollar. I certainly don't know what's going to happen in this case, but I would say that it's probably something to be sanguine about. More to your question, it's a much messier process than this, involving um, not only attorneys, but also, like I said, sometimes there's a dispute over what constitutes a default. I mean, usually it's pretty straightforward, whether you're a secured creditor or a general creditor or so on, but sometimes there are controversies about who should be paid or who's at fault and that sort of thing. This is, by comparison, much cleaner, much more straightforward. Better yet, it's, it's really going to be defined by the market. It's going to be market-driven rather than um, a result of litigation to exhaustion. Wow, 40% on the dollar. That actually seems quite high compared to what I remember seeing uh, Bitcoin Builder. That was like four cents on the dollar. So, <laughs> Yeah, the estimate was 40 cents and the actual number wound up being eight cents. And I remember people telling me that 40 cents was probably on the low end that the number would be much higher. But actually, as it turned out, the number was vastly lower. 
Well, but where did that number come from? I think that's a really important question because, like, again, here we have the market saying, okay, there's a four, four cent on the dollar recovery if you're buying at this exchange. And, but I mean, like, I, I think that that kind of proves the point that you're making, right, Peter? If I remember correctly, and, I'm, and I'm, in this case, I'm usually not, but in this case, I'm quite sure the 40 cents was a number that was derived from the past cycle of defaults which is uh, really quite a specious basis because you're talking about different companies and the different state that balance sheets are in. And certainly the nature of the financial crisis in 2008 was very different than what we had between, say, 1990 and 1992 or so. And we could go into a whole discussion about past information and its bearing on the on present day or in the future. But that's where that number came from. The 40 cent number that was used as pretty much standard in many of the credit default swaps at the time turned out being, uh, you know, like I said, uh, much, much higher than, act- than it actually was. And I have a feeling that in the next crisis, when it inevitably comes, what we'll find is that the, the numbers being used in this time are probably on the low side. But who knows? Again, who knows? And I think that's the point. Adam, since you guys are looking at the first application as Gox coin, what other companies do you think this could help out with? Do you think this could, even if you have a, a firm that's not in working in conjunction with the crypto ledger or crypto protocol, maybe, for example, like RIM, that make Blackberries and so on, they're supposedly going to be going bankrupt. Do you think, is there a way you could create a Blackberry coin to help them organize their own bankruptcy if they end up going through a horrible mess? Or is this only a, a being able to be applied to organizations that have completely gone, like you said, into turtle mode, this is this barricade mode. Well, I think that it's partly about the barricade mode and mostly it's about, it's just about if it's crypto or not. I think that really has a lot, a lot to do with it. You could have a BlackBerry do something like this, but everybody would have to agree. And having that happen seems kind of unlikely. So it's better that these solutions, you know, like once these are more developed and people have seen them succeed, then yeah, I think this will be viewed as a preferable option to a lot of other options that are out there simply because it, it, it never traps you. That's, that's really the thing here. We're trying to give people options so that even if they're not great options, they at least have some options because there's nothing worse than being trapped in a situation where you know that you're not only screwed, but you're going to be for years. Some people would just rather completely get out of that, even if it is just a couple pennies on the dollar so they can not have that stress in their life. So again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. The point is, is that we don't know what's going on now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And this is the only solution that doesn't require us to know either of those things in order to still make a good decision. Basically, uh, that's all you can do with this nebulous framework. Uh, speaking of which, uh, David, maybe the listeners would like to know a little bit more about how the protocol actually works with the, with this. I understand you guys are issuing a one-time only Gox coins. How does it actually, how does the your protocol uh, keep track of these? Like the transparency side might be something listeners may be interested in. So let me give you a little background on the master protocol. Master is actually an acronym for metadata archival by standard transaction embedding records. And that's literally exactly what the protocol does. It's embedding records using standard transactions into uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. And so these are actually... Bitcoin transactions, but they're not regular Bitcoin transactions, right? They've got a little bit of metadata attached. And so the software, when you download Master Protocol Wallet or Client, can say, oh, that's not a regular transaction. That's a Master Coin or that's a Gox Coin or that's a Storage Coin or whatever user currency person is identifying. And so basically, we're using Bitcoin as a cryptographic ledger. And that sort of adds a lot of value to Bitcoin in itself. Right now, the two major values for Bitcoin are a payment network and a store of wealth. But it's also a great cryptographic ledger to store records of uh, valuable financial assets. And this is sort of a really good example of that. So the way that the Master Protocol works is people can issue uh, user currencies on top of it. And basically what they're doing is they're just getting an identification number for this particular currency. So let's say this gets issued as the third user currency on the master protocol. The beginning of that metadata would identify it as a number three uh, user currency. And so it could be identified as this is a Gox coin. And so this can be done without any changes to the Bitcoin protocol. This works within the standard transaction architecture for Bitcoin. And I think this is a really important use case for Bitcoin because I think it adds an enormous amount of value to be able to transfer financial assets on the ledger and not just things over the payment network and not just holding Bitcoins as a store of wealth. I think that's sort of the third 
great use case that we're going to see for Bitcoin is this general ledger uh, that stores this information. The master protocol, all it's doing is interpreting that data. It's a standard by which we're interpreting that information. So all of the records are just as transparent as the Bitcoin ledger. So you can see the coins moving back and forth from different addresses as people move them. But just like Bitcoin, it's uh, synonymous where there's no personally identifiable information attached to the transaction. And so it's just numbers going back and forth. So it's transparent in the sense that we can see funds moving around and we can see what people are trading them for. If they're using the master protocol distributed exchange, they can actually offer these tokens uh, for other tokens, for Bitcoin or for MasterCoin or for other cryptocurrencies and trade them on the Bitcoin ledger itself. And you don't have any third party or other exchange that you have to trust. Those are records that all are all kept on top of Bitcoin. So that's sort of just a, a general overview of how it works. It's still in the early stages. The protocol was launched about six months ago. Uh, the distributed exchange was in testing right now and will be launched later this month and the user currencies are in development too. And so this is all sort of just becoming possible on the technology side. And I think that's why we're seeing this as the first time people are proposing to use it. Right. And we, you know, that was why we pulled in MasterCoin is because there are several other protocols that are all going to offer kind of similar options. But the reality is, is that Master Protocol has the stuff ready. They have white label wallets. So, you know, if, if it's if we're ready to go on this from the from the Gox side, then we're going to be ready to go on this from the technology side. And that wasn't true of any other protocol we were really looking at. You're right. <laughs> My own research is I understand that with, with who, who's ready and who's not. Um, Peter, how would you think the adoption in the financial industry would be towards something like using this in a financial institution? For example, uh, some people I've spoken to think you could use a crypto ledger internally to track assets at large financial institutions. So if you did have you know, some kind of bankruptcy like this or some kind of horrible failure, it may be combining with what Adam said, you know, the reason this could work in this situation is because Mt. Gox was using you know, cryptocurrencies. Do you think that in the future, if uh, financial institutions would accept this kind of ledger system internally, it could be used this way? Or do you think they're too conservative for that right now? Uh, to be honest, I think that this is a much better fit for financial institutions than what seems like the straightforward use, which is as a, as a currency. I don't see many big banks wanting to replace fiat currencies for any number of reasons. I won't get into all of them. Wanting to replace those with cryptocurrencies. However, I do think that there is a potential application as an accounting tool and as a way of keeping track of contingent liabilities and that sort of thing. Yeah, so is going on along that uh, line just for a few minutes, if we could speculate with uh, Lehman or Bear Stearns. I know it's also, obviously it was a long, you know, six years ago, so it's it's hard to, right. to gauge whether or not they would have done something like that. But if they had used the, uh, you know, their back office was using something like this to keep track of. I mean, would that even have prevented the, you know, quote unquote explosion of these assets, or would it allow them to liquidate better? Is there is there any advantage of using this internally? With respect to to Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, there's two different situations. Bear Stearns collapsed because of a crisis of confidence, and I don't think there was anything, whether um, uh, in the in the in the fiat currency world or in cryptocurrencies, that would have saved them. With Lehman Brothers, the problems came about. There was also a crisis of currency uh, of, of confidence, but also they were unable to roll uh, their paper, their um, commercial paper, and, and uh, because of that, um, you know, they faced a liquidity crisis. And and to the extent that cryptocurrencies might, for example. Help them to, I guess, I guess, gauge their credit worthiness on the street. If it was more responsive than, say, credit default swaps or something like that, it would be helpful. But I think for right now, cryptocurrencies are probably uh, a, a better fit in terms of uh, accounting than in terms of uh, use as an actual currency for for big banks and large financial ins institutions. But in this particular case, it's more after the fact. I think I think it's this is is much cleaner, uh, more straightforward than say the going courts and uh, uh, you know all the uh, different types of claims that have to be filed and all that sort of thing. I see. Yeah, because the whole accounting issue is is really interesting. Kind of like in a, not an accounting coin, but you use it as a as a third party ledger that can't be abused. And in Adam, I know part of your uh, the human project, you know, you're using different types of tokens, different types of issuance. How can you see financial institutions, particularly exchanges or, or fiat banks of some kind, using some of these kind of technologies internally? Or uh, do you see them that have any motivation or incentive to adopt something like this? 
so that way they could you know, interface with this, this growing cryptocurrency ecosystem. I think that what we're going to see is that cryptocurrencies provide transparency, pseudonymous transparency in a way that we've never had a financial technology be able to do before. I mean, it literally, you can completely open the kimono and see all of the flows without seeing the specifics of it and therefore being able to ascertain the exact business practices. The potential for companies to embrace this and say, and to demonstrate solvency essentially by putting themselves out there, but yet not exposing their private business, just exposing how the flows are going. And then in fact, they do have the amounts of money that they say they have. I think that's a huge opportunity. And the first companies that opt to do it, it'll be hard, but the dividends will be there for them. They will, there will never be concerned that they are insolvent. There will never be concerned that money is being spent in a way that doesn't make sense with, you know, with what the reported uses are, because the flows are right out in the open. Yeah, true transparency for the first time, right? Uh, well, it was great having all three of you here today. Uh, listeners, if you're interested, be sure to check out The Human Project as well as The Master Queen Protocol. It's Google those. And uh, I look forward to talking to you guys. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. This is Chris Joseph bringing you news on Next, the first true second-generation cryptocurrency for March 4th, 2014. One month earlier than planned, the Next project has gone fully open source. An early version of the source code was released on January 3rd, but since then, the code for Next has been completely refactored and rewritten. This announcement makes the current development stream completely open, including code for transparent forging, asset exchange, aliases, and the arbitrary messaging features. All of the source is hosted on Bitbucket, and you can access it through this shortened URL, bit.do slash nxt. That's bit.do slash next. In other news, keep an eye out for next at the Texas Bitcoin Conference. The community has several pairs of boots on the ground and would love to chat. For more general information on next, head to nextcrypto.org or mynxt.org. And stay tuned for more news on next in the next Let's Talk Bitcoin broadcast. This is Stephanie Murphy for Let's Talk Bitcoin. I'm here today talking with Jonathan Terrell. Hi there. Hey, Jonathan. Hello. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin. You've got a company called Metalair, and you're working on a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange, not just for Bitcoin, but for some other cryptocurrencies and fiat. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, it's, it's coin agnostic. So any coin that uses a blockchain-like data structure, we're ultimately hoping we can support them, will be able to be transacted on the exchange. It's a two-stage development. At this stage, we're looking at the crypto-to-crypto -crypto side of things. So you'll be able to exchange cryptocurrencies across blockchain. And the latest development of it is going to be aimed at a decentralized part of the system whereby you can get fiat onto it via an open interface. So anyone can sign up as a reseller or an escrow and then uh, enact Bitcoin transactions for fiat or any other cryptocurrency for fiat on the, on the decentralized exchange. Okay, and you are based out of Brighton, UK, but it sounds like what you're talking about with Metalair, this is going to be a global thing? Absolutely. I mean, once the exchange is launched, we're not in charge. I mean, in the way that Satoshi is not in charge of Bitcoin itself. We, we've got offices here at the university which, with which we're loosely affiliated. But once it's actually launched as a, as a product, it will be totally open source and it will be its own entity that sits on the internet. So much so that in the distant future, when new, new cryptocurrencies are launched, we don't have a say in which ones get selected on there. There will be a proof of work mechanism whereby those are added to the Metal Air Exchange itself, or indeed selected off if uh, currencies become unused or, or become very quiet over a long period of time. How do you accomplish a totally decentralized exchange where there's nobody even in charge deciding what kinds of things are exchanged on the exchange? The exchange itself deals with cryptocurrency or fiat. There's a proof of work mechanism whereby new currencies, are, whether they be cryptographic or fiat, are added to the exchange. When it launches, it will be seeded with, I'm picking some coins here, Litecoin, Bitcoin, the most popular ones, and US dollars, GBP, euros, mm. things like that. What is the proof of work? Say I've launched a new coin, uh, Jonathan coin, mm -hmm. and I want to get it on the exchange. I would have to pay in a currency that's, that's specific to that exchange to have it added onto the exchange. And then once payments have reached a certain amount, that's then added onto the exchange and it's selected onto it. And like I said, if, if, if it becomes that the volume of that currency that's being transacted is low, 
it will be selected off of the exchange in, in the distant future. Oh. So there, there needs to be a cost to prevent that, to prevent people. I think, for example, if I wanted to DDoS the system, I could just put hundreds of spurious requests onto the network and say, oh, I'm going to add a thousand different coins now. Mm-hmm. And it would completely attack the system, basically, and, and bring it to a halt. So it's a way of mitigating Sybil and, and DOS attacks that can be launched against the system. We've been very careful about making sure the way it's designed that there is a cost in doing everything. A bid ask uh, has a cost. Um, transactions have a cost. Adding a uh, new currency, if you want to get your currency elected on, that has a cost. Indeed, in fact, lo- logging on as a, an escrow to transact fiat has a cost. So we've been very careful about making sure that, that the network itself is set up correctly using proof of work so that there aren't the ability to civil attack it, basically, or, or DOS it. Would the costs for different operations on the exchange, such as adding a currency pair or logging on or creating a bid ask are those determined by a market mechanism we haven't decided at this stage but it will probably be a float uh, so it will be based on uh, the volumes being transacted because you're paying in effectively a currency to enact things on that blockchain so it will be a percentage there of that currency that's currently in circulation is there going to be somebody deciding that basically there's not going to be a, a group of central planners it will it will be it will be an algorithm that decides right. it in the way that the blockchain uh, the, the bitcoin network itself adjusts its difficulty right the metal Air exchange will decide what the cost of adding a coin at any particular time, point in time is give me a picture of how you see this working you said in the beginning that this could allow basically merchants and different points in the physical world to... Yeah, I've probably started in slightly the wrong place with this, but I think the best point to start would be to get an understanding of how one would transact cross-blockchain. Mm. Um, at the moment, I don't know if you know what a double spending attack is. Yes. So I would I would put a, a, a spurious transaction that I don't intend to on onto the network. I would secretly mine on a separate network with more hashing. What this network does is it looks at a transaction that's gone onto it. When two users meet who want to uh, enact a bid ask to say I'm swapping Litecoin for Bitcoin, we would agree a certain number of confirmations that were going to take place. The network then locks each transaction into uh, an M of N transaction. So you and I can agree that gets locked away. The network acts as the escrow in that instant and it watches to see how many transactions we've agreed on. Say it's 20 for Bitcoin, 40 for Litecoin. When those um, confirmations have been met, uh, it then releases the funds to each party. If a double spending attack occurs, mm. it refunds them to each party. So it can reverse. Obviously, you're not reversing on the blockchain, but you are refunding that balance back to the individual. Yeah, it's a secure way of proofing against double spending and enacting a transaction crypto to crypto cross blockchain. There's actually a couple of other ways we come up with doing this but they're a bit complicated and I don't want to go into them. So effectively, that's the first mechanism. It lets you transact crypto for crypto. With that multi-signature transaction feature, most exchanges right now that are centralized do this, mm. but they don't do it in the same way that you do it, right? Like with yours, it's pretty much built in to the... Yeah, there's effectively, a, you could almost call it an agent or an algorithm that's running on the network that does that. Mm. So in, in that, uh, say, Gox or someone like that holds your funds and has the promissory that they will pay you Bitcoin or dollars when you come to withdraw, that doesn't happen in this instance because your coins are held on the blockchain and they're released. No one is holding your coins. They're locked on the network. You can't lose your coins. And in fact, worst case, if there was, say, a nuclear war or something like that in the middle of doing a transaction, because it's M of N, you can actually find the party you were transacting with and recover your coins at a later point, even if the network itself goes down. So it's quite a, quite a well-designed redundant system that we've got here. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So I think that brings up a great point because with centralized exchanges, there is this tendency to you know, say, well, we're going to basically create an interface that shows something to the customer that looks like you have this amount of Bitcoins or this amount of dollars or Litecoins mm. in your account, but you really don't. It's really being stored kind of behind the scenes, perhaps in, Absolutely. Perhaps in it's cold not, storage. It's not transparent and it, it could be even fractional reserve behind the scenes. You don't know that. So you don't know that the, the promissory that you're seeing on that screen is actually something you're going to get out at the end of the day. Well, exactly. And there is, I think, a big temptation once an exchange starts to do that. It's not too far off for them to think, well, we can just do some fractional reserve stuff. With Metal Air, this is not possible. Is that right? Because every, Absolutely, yeah. everything is I mean, completely transparent. It's all happening on the blockchain and there's no central authority to actually take any of those coins and do anything with them that nobody can see. Exactly. You can see all the transactions that are occurring across the two blockchains that you're using and everyone involved in that transaction can see it so it's totally transparent. Does Metal Air make any kind of profit off of this or is, does that come from... We're, there's kind of altruistic element to this in that, you know, 
once it's launched that product in fact the design of it can't work unless it is completely open source so you know we've we've not shot ourselves in the foot so to speak but there has to be another revenue model that sits alongside that Mm -hmm. the way we're working in at the moment and this is very much dependent on the investor that we go to market with is that the wallet itself uh, is an interface to multiple balances that you may hold so it's a multi-currency wallet Mm -hmm. and we've also talked to another couple of other companies who've come to us when we first went in the media quite a few people came up to us and they said well we're actually looking at offering futures contracts or other financial products using alt currencies and, and cryptocurrencies so what we would provide on that interface is the ability to download a module you then get that say futures contract service and by buying through us we take a percentage cut of it so that's the business model of it on the side at the same time the wallet software is totally open source so other people can go and take it and do their own thing with it but we're hoping that we will become a large and fairly canonical wallet for multi-cryptocurrency transactions. As a result, we'll have a large user base, and that's where the business model is. Right. And the, the value I see in this is that it sounds like it's it's simple. You know, like you're doing something that a lot of other people have tried to do or said that they're going to do, but they want to do all this extra stuff on top of it too. Well, there's an awful lot of, and this is just human motivation, everyone's launching their own cryptocurrency. They say it's a decentralized exchange, but actually all of these different exchanges are just doing color coins locally on that blockchain, which is, a, again, it's linked to an asset or something like that. Mm. And also there's an element of pre-mining. Everyone sort of needs to go, well, how do I make a profit out of this? So we've been very careful about making sure that there's no pre-mining in our system. Once it's out there, we're not benefiting from the system itself. We're benefiting from the wallet that links to it. I could imagine that there's a lot of savings in the potential security costs. If you're not having a centralized exchange where you're storing people's coins somewhere or storing people's fiat somewhere, and then, of course, there's, you know, you got to secure that against governments, which isn't always possible. You know, if you don't have to worry about any of that because you are not actually holding anything or it's all being held on the blockchains, then that really kind of sounds like it frees up your resources to concentrate on some other things. Absolutely. I mean, we've purposefully kept our business footprint, if you like, small. The development team that's needed to support this and the wallet once it's launched is not going to be many developers at all. In fact, I dare say we'll probably have more people involved in marketing and pushing the software out and doing the website than we will in the actual development of the software once it's up and running. It's a deliberately small footprint and it reduces currently all kinds of issues around legislation, holding funds, etc. And all of that is then down to the responsibility of the individuals using their wallet. So it keeps the business itself quite streamlined. Just a multi-currency wallet by itself is a really cool thing. Would this be like a web interface or would it be something that somebody could actually download to, to like a computer? Well, um, I mean, at this stage, the wallet is, 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 there are many ways we can cut it. There could potentially be a, a web interface, but again, you'd be looking at a central party who'd be hosting that, which may be right. us. Uh, there's certainly going to be a software client. Um, depending, again, on the, the kind of investor we go with, we're looking at it for, you know, uh, Android, uh, tablets, uh, laptops, desktops, things like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that we're very keen on as well as hardware wallets, I think ultimately you can't get true security on wallets per se until they shift to the hardware level. But that's sort of a few steps away from us. First of all, we need to actually get the exchange up and running, and then we'll look at moving to possibly even partnering with some kind of hardware wallet, wallet provider. So you're thinking really big there. Well, that's, that's further off. Right now we're concentrating on the crypto-to-crypto crypto side of things, mm-hmm. the crypto-to-fear, and also the wallet side of things as well, which we have de-risked in the last year. To make a multi-currency wallet, that's, that's something that hasn't been done before on a software level. There have been, you know, sort of web interfaces, but it's really not what you're talking about, which is something where you actually have full control over all those wallets with different cryptocurrencies that are included in there. How do you even begin <laughs> to code something like that that's adaptable and can add and drop different cryptocurrencies uh, based on these market mechanisms of whether people add them or take them away from the exchange? This is why we need to be very careful about what currencies get added to the exchange. Like I say, when it launches, it will be seeded with certain currencies. Mm-hmm. And again, this is still this the part of it, the specifics of how the software wallet will actually work or work in progress. Mm-hmm. But we believe at this stage it's going to be a module you would download per currency, for example. So your wallet is basically as, as, as large as it needs to be to support a, a relevant currency. And then there's also a way, certain ways to keep the actual blockchain data size that you need to store locally reduced. So we're looking at that as well. But like I say, I think the majority of these are reasonably well solved problems at this stage it's more the the exchange side of things that we're focusing on does the bitcoin blockchain or the litecoin blockchain need to be pruned before this can be accomplished or do you think you could do it at this stage i don't know but i I know it's a solved problem but uh in terms of of how we would address that locally on a wallet there's there's a number of ways to do that it it sounds like there's some pretty serious coding going on in this i mean yes in fact 
uh, it, it seems um, tautological, but the cross blockchain exchange stuff was was fairly difficult. A proof of work mechanism for selecting which cryptocurrencies are bought onto the exchange was reasonably straightforward. The hardest part is actually not coming up with a bid ask mechanism whereby users can't. Uh, maliciously spam the network with bid asks they have no intention of completing and again we've come up with a solution to that so as far as getting fiat into this decentralized exchange can you kind of paint a picture of how you think that might work yeah so the second part of the exchange is the the fiat to fiat side i think i've covered enough but um in terms of a um, fiat to crypto side of it there would be an open interface whereby users can sign up their there will be a cost entailed on that, which we haven't quite finalised. Again, paid for through proof of work. Once they're on there, they would receive a rating a bit like an eBay seller rating, and there's going to be a web of trust system in there as well. So you would be able to use recommended sellers with, a, sorry, recommended escrow with a rating to handle your fiat when you're exchanging on the on the exchange itself. Because as everyone knows, you can transact Bitcoin very easily on the blockchain. Doesn't involve a third party. But whenever you're touching fiat, you have to go over an escrow. I know the escrow is mediated by the a uh, decentralized exchange itself but what about the data that tells people who is trustworthy you know who's a trustworthy seller or whatever is there some way to incorporate that into the blockchain so there may be information that people can provide about themselves but as you know in the world currently there is no cryptographic proof to show that somebody's scan of a passport is genuine that scan of a passport right. the way that this mechanism actually works is there's a cost in signing up as an account and then the account becomes more valuable the more transactions you've enacted on it so nobody would want to spuriously go and damage an account based on the costs that they do into getting that account to the status that it's in so basically you'll end up with a system where people in their bedroom in India, two large, well-known household trusted names, will be signing up and acting as an escrow service. And then you take your pick of those based on their current rating that they've got on the network. Does this effectively mediate, mediate fiat to fiat exchanges as well? Like if somebody wanted to, let's say I'm in art. That we're not supporting. <laughs> that you're not supporting. We're not supporting that, no. We may, uh, but at this stage, it's not on our development path. So. What's to stop somebody if, if I'm in Argentina and I've got some pesos that I want to exchange into dollars... If I go to a, a merchant and I buy some bitcoins and then I immediately sell those bitcoins for dollars, yes, you know, yes. So you could do that indirectly, but sorry, I should be more specific. The, the exchange itself won't support a fiat to fiat transaction, but in a two step stage, you could you could direct indirectly go fiat to fiat. Yes, you could definitely do that. How close is this to launching? How, do, how when do you think that some of the functionality might be? At this stage, we're talking to investors. We are talking to some who I won't name because we're actually under non-disclosure, but if we get the right investors on board, it could be very big for us in terms of it's a good matching of a relationship between two par- parties. Mm. Most of the entire development is de-risked at this stage. We've got modules that work. We're ready to produce an alpha cut, which I reckon is probably three to six months work, something like that, depending on the development team we get on board. But we are bottlenecked by investors. As ever, I don't know if anyone's gone down the path of investment. It, it, it can slow things down just talking with investors. We were hoping to go the donations route, but it's not been, the donations weren't as, as strong as we'd hoped they'd be. So we're very much relying on investors and our partnerships with the companies at this stage. Can you say any of the other companies that you're partnered with or... So we're not actually partnered with anyone specifically mm-hmm. yet, but we are in negotiations with a couple of uh, entities who could be very interesting if they come on board. And are you looking for people to join your team or development team? Or Absolutely, yeah. We're looking for developers, particularly people who are strong in cryptography and who actually understand Bitcoins, Merkle trees, proof of work, things like that, um, to quite a high level. If anyone's out there who's interested, please do contact us. And as ever, we're looking for investors and donations as well. So I'm just kind of thinking about all the implications of the first decentralized exchange, because to me, it seems like you could potentially be the first because this might be happening in a couple of months. You know, if you, yeah. if you get the investors. If, if things go right, it could definitely be happening. An alpha and possibly even a beta could be out this year if, if things move as smoothly as I hope that they will. If there's a decentralized exchange going on, how does aggregate price data come out of that? I think we could see pretty easily what crypto to crypto trading, what prices were, were coming in for that. But what about fiat to crypto trading? So the way the data structures are stored in the system is its ratios of what currencies were exchanged to what per, and then they're blocked off in units of time. Mm-hmm. There are direct relationships between, say I swap bitcoins for dollars. I know in a transaction that actually happened, that many bitcoins were swapped for that many dollars. And if that forms, say, two sides of a triangle, 
Bitcoin and Litecoin and Bitcoin and dollars, you can then infer a cost between Litecoin and dollars. So the exchange logs information of exchanges that have actually happened and also it can then infer secondary information of exchanges that have happened. So there's several ways to pull information out of this decentralized system to get an idea of how price is varying with time. This data could be really interesting because with a decentralized exchange, I think anybody who's looked at Bitcoin prices over the lifetime of Bitcoin has noticed that with different exchanges, the exchange rates with fiat are actually different because Mm. there's a difficulty and a cost of getting fiat money in or out of the exchange. And there's Mm. a difficulty or a cost of using the exchange. And so the prices actually end up different. And so I think, you know, if there was a decentralized exchange that was actually truly decentralized, maybe we'd see a little bit more truth in the data. That tells yeah, us I mean, a dollar on Gox is worth less than a dollar on Bitstamp. And we all know why that is because of the withdrawal time. Exactly. So, yeah, you're absolutely you're right. There's a discrepancy between it. And the Bitcoin community can treat the uh, Meta Layer exchange prices as another benchmark or the benchmark. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I guess it's another exchange that's in the mix. Yeah, exactly. Right now, we sort of have these these aggregators that pull data from all the different exchanges and weight it by the volume on each exchange. But with Metalair, you know, that might be the gold standard in terms of price discovery because there's not those extraneous factors to worry about with centralized exchanges. Yes, yes. yes. I, that would be a very nice thing for us to have if, if it did become the gold standard. So, but the, the key thing is here that there's no absolute pricing. It's relative to the exchanges that were made at any given instance in time, and that's what's logged to the system. Yes, Absolutely. And again, that comes down to proof of work because you're only logging the transactions that have been paid for. Anyone can spuriously make up some costs, but it's only once there's been a cost entailed and the transactions actually happened and fees have been spent on doing that, which can't be got back, then that's actually logged as an actual valuation. I was just wondering if any of the fees that that a user would pay yeah. to do something on the Metalair network. Do any of those fees, kind of like Bitcoin yeah, mining, so there are transaction fees? Of, yeah. Yeah, do they go so there are, there are a system of miners on there that are doing something a bit like mining that is securing the network, mm-hmm. making sure transactions happen. They're also receiving a reward on that process, and it's it's securing the network sort of cryptographically from a proof-of-work point of view. So yes, there is a, a process within that, and that will all become clear when we launch. But it's it, the key thing about designing this is it's got to be, from a proof-of-work point of view and cryptography point of view, of view, it's got to be sound under the bonnet. It's got to be very, very simple to use on the surface. Uh, and all, all financial systems going back to the 1600s, if you look, they had a, uh, in fact, they used to use uh, shipping chits with the East India Company, and they were very easy to forge, but they're very convenient. Uh, selection has always favoured convenience with financial systems. So we've made sure that, like Bitcoin, our exchange system, when it comes up to, when, when people come to use it, is very simple to use. And under the bonnet, it's actually as complex as it needs to be, but it's also secure as a result of that. Could anybody participate in contributing to the Metal Air network? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're going to have basically, for one of a better word, we're going to have miners and stuff like that who come on the network. They can use different types of hashing algorithms and they are going to be enforcing. There's a blockchain data structure that logs a lot of the transactions that are happening and they'll be involved in making sure that that's kept up to date for each block that's generated and for the transaction records as they're kept on the exchange. And they will be receiving rewards for doing that. Oh, great. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, I'm trying to skirt around it a bit, but that's basically the gist of how it works. And again, they will be, so there'll be kind of minus one of a better word on the system, people enacting things and other stuff on there that, 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 that doesn't look too dissimilar to Bitcoin in some respects, but is also an exchange. Yeah, Jonathan, I really appreciate how you're able to talk about this in a way that I can understand without a technical Thank background. You. How did you get this idea and why did you decide to do this? My background is artificial intelligence, computer science. I've run a, a company that does uh, sort of high-end networking for government and institutions like that. Um, a good friend of mine who works at the university runs another company. He's, he, in fact, set up a virtual worlds company to do economics and virtual worlds. And we struck up a conversation about this December 2012. Um, and we were looking at meta approaches to dealing with different blockchains in aggregate. And we both went away and came back and said, we both sort of met each other and we're like, yeah, we both had an idea and we talked and we realized we both had a fairly similar idea, actually. Obviously, uh, seeded by the conversations we'd had previously. And after quite a number of technical discussions, this emerged. And it's, it's been quite a lot of work and in, in, in actual coding to check that it, you know, our functional ideas to actually implement well. And, yeah. and we've got to a stage now where we're saying, yes, this, this works, it has legs, we're now looking for investment and we want to implement it. So it's been the work of myself. And in fact, the chap's called Kerry Fraser Robinson, you can see him on the website. We're looking for investment at in this stage we think we've got it to a point where it's been worked through sufficiently we've both got backgrounds in computer science that that it's it's a, a robust design i don't doubt that you have a background in ai but mm. what 
was your motivation for it? Do you want to free the world with a decentralized exchange? Uh, Tell me about that. I don't know. I, I guess I get irritated by the way governments treat their currency and, you know, they, they have the issuance of fiat and things like this. In a kind of nerdy way, I've always been very interested in fractional reserve banking and other systems. In 2009, I, was, I, I, I briefly dabbled in writing a sci-fi novel and I came up with a form of centralized currency, but it had um, a system of mining and it had a system of network difficulty to adjust the rate of coin generation based on the current rates of interest in that environment at a given time. So this kind of, when I discovered Bitcoin a few years later, I was thinking, this is the idea I had, but so much better. Uh, in fact, the, the time I found out about it, I took all my savings account, moved into Bitcoin, uh, and I went and ran around and told my friends and family about it, and they thought I was nuts. But you know, here we are a couple of years later. Um, <laughs> right, they're so not this saying is, that this, you know, I, I have an altruistic bent, I think, and uh, it's, this, is, this is very much in line with stuff I've always been interested in. So it just sort of fits naturally with me, I guess. This is a big enough project, right? You're, you're doing a decentralized mm-hmm. exchange and a multi-currency wallet and combining those two. But do you have any other pie-in-the-sky ideas that could potentially be things that interface with the decentralized exchange or like other layers that um, could be built on top of we've it? We've got some sort of improved uh, like two-factor authentication ideas mm-hmm. for software wallets and things like that, but they're still, again, sort of work in progress. To be honest, we, I'm, I have to be quite disciplined with myself and focus on one project at a time, so this is very much has had my attention for the last couple of months and yeah. trying to make sure I don't get distracted with other ideas. Um, yeah, that makes but, sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I've been, I've been fairly strict in that respect, and I'd say this has been my, my main focus. Right, and you did mention the hardware idea, and I think that's a cool idea too. Yeah, I think we'll probably will be working with a hardware manufacturer or supplier as and when we get to that stage, if we get to that stage, um, to develop a hardware wallet. Because I think, I think one of the, the last uh, security problems with Bitcoin is that all software wallets, it doesn't matter where you put them, um, are fundamentally insecure and that people can just log in keystrokes and see what's going on. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the hardware wallet is a step change in, in mitigating that. Jonathan, anything else you want to add? At this stage, no. I mean, please, everyone, come check out the website. Uh, if you want to donate, do. And I'm hoping uh, we'll have some news in the next couple of months for investment and uh, we'll be able to actually make an announcement when we're launching. All right. So your website is metalair.org, M-E-T-A-L-A-I-R.org. That's all. That's it, yeah. You can also follow Metalair on Twitter, which is how you and I met. Check it out. It, I'm very excited about your project and I can't wait to hear an update, hopefully in a couple months. Good luck with everything, yes. Jonathan. And thanks for chatting with me today. Okay, Stephanie, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to episode 89 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show was provided by David Johnson, Tim Swanson, Pete Earle, Stephanie Murphy, John Turrell, and Adam B. Levine. This episode was produced by Adam B. Levine, edited by Denise Levine, Matthew Zipkin, and Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Any questions or comments? Email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Have a good one.